Hey, good evening, folks. This is Shumantro. I come from the QA team, uh, Fedora QA team, and I'm going to talk a little bit about LLMs, uh, Gen AI, and Podman Desktop today. Ah, makes sense. Right, so most of us have either experimented with ChatGPT and Gen AI like solutions for, for some time now. It has been in the market, and a lot of us have used it. A lot of us have fed data to such um, services and we have got interesting results. Some of us have even used it uh, more or less to either plan itineraries or do random chores here and there. But one of the most important thing about feeding data to such models is it actually learns from them. And one of the things that happens is we tend to lose control on how much data we are giving and how much data, how much trust we are putting into such models, which we may, may not be able to regain back at a later point of time. Most of these models also uh, have or come with very strong biases about certain things. So as a result, when you actually see the results come out from most of these models, it's highly unpredictable to a nature and also sometimes can be garbage in and garbage out, right? But so one of the most important quotes that I wanted to highlight has probably been said mostly right by the Hugging Face CEO. Moving on, the need of the hour that we all talk about and we kind of swear by is we need to use AI and we need to you know, implement AI-like solutions for workloads. And the thing that we forget, or rather we don't implement or understand completely, is when we in infer with the term AI, we are specifically talking the gen AI part of things, but there are multiple levels that it is seated into, one of which that we kind of focus or we don't understand or don't talk about for beginners is the part that we still need to understand all the levels before we dive into Gen AI. Um, one of the very interesting examples that I'm going to show today, which is going to actually implement a particular Fedora contribution process and making it happen using Gen AI to an extent. I would not stick by saying that that's the most perfect way of doing things, but that's exactly one of the good uses that I have found out myself. Uh, moving on, th there is also, there, there's this one thing that when we talk about really using Gen AI, we talk about using user prompts, which are like words or sentences put together to one of these large language models or uh, models which have already been trained with data to spit out information that are relevant to us um, in form or fashion. Uh, one of the biggest examples of utilizing Gen AI today has been the core of most of our jobs applications, and it has become it has become integral part. So we keep we keep putting more and more data into Gen AI, hoping that it would actually give us meaningful and more meaningful information. And it does, because the more you put a set of prompts, the more you train that model to become efficient in providing you information that you need. Not always closer to what you would be able to take and implement, but you would mostly be able to read through it, understand, and do something about it. But as you understand most of these things, if you want to get relative good information, you got to pay a lot of money because most of these, as it goes, requires, I mean, you, you basically hit an API, which is, which is currently costing a lot of money to open AI, to train with inputs and the training data to give you the optimized output that you're looking at. So ChatGPT has a paid subscription and a, a lot of them have paid subscriptions right now which you, you should be able to use once you pay it. The only thing that you end up doing is once you pay such an amount of money, you always want the best of solutions so you keep get, 
giving it more crucial data and which is not good ideally for companies. One of the biggest example is for developers, it, uh, you know, when, when you want to give such data access to um, API models, then, I mean, service models, then you don't actually control most of this. When you run, however, when you run all of this locally, you actually get a lot of benefits that come with it. Like, for example, you have, um, for developers, you have, you can actually customize um, and control the endpoints. You can actually control what data you throw at it. You can, at most of the times, delete things which you don't need. Uh, if you send it a file or an object to analyze, you can also delete the object, which is ideally not the case with things like ChatGPT. Uh, for organization, this does a very good job with privacy and control, right? So, but here's the thing. Every time we kind of think about running all these models locally, we also think about what a pain point would it be to set up those things on a system. Right. And specifically for somebody who is using like a laptop, uh, it ideally would mean huge graphics cards and whatnot. And to a lot of folks, that is very off putting and exactly why they want to avail the convenience of putting things into um, like a Gemini or ChatGPT and get better outputs rather than setting them by themselves. Um, in this context, we have got something like a Podman Desktop AI Lab. And Podman Desktop AI Lab does this a fantastic job at actually running the LLMs on your local system without putting so much effort into um, building it from scratch, um, downloading them yourself, and then training them all by yourself. You don't have to do that. There, it's mere few clicks, and you can set up your own AI lab, and you can start doing something about it, right? Uh, the another important thing that the Podman Desktop does is, by default, it would take your Podman operations and GUIFY them, if you will, um, as in the sense that you don't need to actually write a long Podman commands. You can actually do everything in the Podman desktop itself. Podman AI Lab is just an extension that you add to Podman desktop software in order to enable you to do the Gen AI stuff. So here's what you, know, you get as a part of Podman um, Gen AI. You not only have a large list, list of models you can choose from, and these go all the way from, um, so currently there is, there's a team in Red Hat called Instruct Lab, and they're trying to make a model, which is uh, Granite, if I remember correctly. Um, they're trying to make something like that to ensure that you get more defined output with specific, comma, specific prompts, but the, Interesting part is if there are multiple open source models that you can also use um, to actually you know, leverage. Um, important thing is when we see and talk about Gen AI, we always talk about what can a Gen AI do for us? And usually if you look at our API providers, we see you can, you can generate code, you can generate um, like summarization scripts, you can do chatbots and whatnot, right? You, you can basically use it to do multitude of activities. The recent uh, GPT 4.0 model lets you even set contexts for each of these uh, conversations that you have in place. Like for example, if you were to have, uh, if, if you were to do this conversation with ChatGPT, you can actually have a particular context set to a particular conversation and then it would listen and understand whatever your prompts are regarding that particular context. You may have a different set of context for different line of um, chats that you have on ChatGPT. However, this is not that advanced. It is, however, going to be able to give you a working model or a, a way to interface with LLMs and still get the work done. You still have to do a little bit of a manual work, if you will, to get it up and running. 
So to start off, um, we have something called recipes. And recipes are these pre-built hacks, if you will. And they, they, they give you exactly everything that you need to do with Gen AI. But that would be very, very templated out in the current extension. I mean, there are roadmaps for these uh, for this extension to have more AI use cases. Currently, what it does is it summarizes. It has a chat chatbot. It has an object detection, and um, it has an audio text, audio audio text. Those are the five pre-built stuff mostly that it does today. It, there can be and will obviously be more and more apps that you can integrate. And um, well, it would become more optimized as we go on. But given those are our recipes today, we also have, like I told you, most of these are model catalogs, uh, or rather, they're, they're, they're a list of models that you can choose from. You can download them, store them locally on your system, and then have um, your apps back by those downloaded LLMs from your local machine. Um, one of which is, I mean, one of the basic things is you can also bring your own model, if you will. Like, say, so if you have a model which you have already pre-trained with a data set, you can actually use the GGUF file and import it to your model catalog in the Podman desktop itself, and that would work. Um, the playgrounds is where the fun happens. So playground is, think about play, playgrounds as your, um, well, your local, your local agent to run a context. So if I were to uh, do a test case generator, if you will, then I would basically ask or create a playground environment where I would say, I want to customize my prompts to be read and understood in a certain manner or form. And that would be using these pre-tuned parameters that I am putting. And these pre-tuned parameters are set into three different, I mean, set, in, or set and customized in three different ways, which is the temperature, the max tokens, and the top K. I'll, I'll come to it when I demo. But the whole idea here is that you basically set up an environment or you tell your model that, hey, I'm going to actually tell you what would you be processing as a part of this prompt that I give you next. Um, now, a demo time. And here's the actual thing. So I'll, I'll demo off, but here's the actual thing. I'll be using the Mistral 7B in this case for the demo. And um, the whole idea would be to basically use, to download that, I would be creating a service, which would then be back, backing up my LLM. I would be starting that service to, I mean, with a defined scope. And finally, I would be customizing that um, with uh, the scope that I have. Currently, I am using, I'm going to use it to generate test cases. Um, so for context of people in Fedora, test cases in Fedora are maintained uh, by um, maintained in something called wiki-tcms. It is a plain wiki syntax that we use to maintain most of our test cases. Um, what I would be doing is I would be telling this model that, hey, you need to generate test cases for packages which are user-focused. And you would be using um, this particular wiki template. And I'm going to give it the wiki template for it to understand the context. Ah, very good. Do we have internet? Yes, we do. Can I play it? Yes. So for the sake of timing, I'm going to just increase this to a 2x, because that would give me some time. So if you look there, I have given a, a system prompt, which is, hey, you are a test case generator tool. Uh, no, I, I'm, I'll be going. You, I'll be going to give you packages and package names, and I'll be expecting um, package test case, and then the entire block of code. Uh, it would generate a test case for Podman right now for you, and this is going to be the the temp. It would be following the template that I just gave it. 
So once it is done, I should be able to copy this test case. I mean, obviously I have to validate because all that I'm doing, all that I'm doing now is I'm just getting the wiki data, nothing else. Uh, so once the test case generation completes, I still need to validate that test case before I even put it on a real wiki and call it a test case for Podman. But that in general becomes the workload for, I mean, th that general becomes the test case for, um, you know. Uh, So, <laughs> so anyway, uh, having said that, uh, do we move to a different? <laughs> wow, this is going to be fun. I, I almost forgot how to move to the next slide. <laughs> oh shit! No, I don't. I really don't need it. Yeah. Okay. So. For all the guys who really want to contribute to Podman Desktop, there's, you can actually hit up the podman.io, podman.desktop.io, and uh, the GitHubs and the chat. Uh, fun part, QA team does a lot of test days with Podman minor releases and Podman Desktop. So if you are somebody who is found this in presentation interesting and would want to contribute to um, either LLMs or apps or test out these or test more of these, write more test cases, uh, you know, please feel free to reach out to the QA team and we would love to um, help you, uh, help you um, contribute to Fedora and make it better. With that, I conclude my presentation. Thanks for being here and I'm up for questions. I have many, so anybody want to go before me can go. Yeah. Okay, so how many billion parameters maximum we can train with? Seven billion. Maximum. Yep. That is max for? That's Mistral 7B is the max you can go. Okay, and? Uh, yep. Uh, I have taken, so if, if I go back a little um, on my demo, you should see that I have set the temperature to, uh, 0.2, um, ideally that would mean the, the point 20 percent, the first 20 percent is actually the relevant data that I feel of the tokens that generates that I feel is valid for a test case. If I set it to, if I set the temperature to 0.8, then it would become a very fancy dreamable Podman test case, which is going to be a clear garbage in and a garbage out. So low, the lower you keep the temperature, the relevant you get your output. And um, as you can see, I have not maxed out the tokens. Uh, you can still max out the tokens if you will. Maximum context length yep. for this. Yep. Okay. That is a bit low as compared. To, is there any plans to uh, make it more this larger, the scope to support So, larger yes. Scope? So, the thing is, it still is the basic Mistral model at this point. This is not trained with any data. If, like I said, you can still have a trained data set imported to Podman desktop and that should give you, uh, I mean, you can build your own GGUFs and import and then that from that you can base out whatever you want. You can still do that. There are plans to actually make it in the Podman desktop itself so you don't have to pre-train it somewhere and then bring it. But then we have these 70 billion and 250 billion parameters, models already available, LLMs, which are open source. Right? Yes. So can't we use them? The yes, you can download all of this. So let me just, um, that's actually a very good thing. Let me just do this. So for, they all are available in the hugging phase, right? Yep. So let me just, oh yeah. So you see that there is catalog. These are all the models that are available. However, I am working on the Mistral 7B. So you see that's downloaded. But if I keep downloading more, then I can, I, I have list. Mm -hmm. I have a list. Okay, good. 
then in one of the slides you talk about the fine tuning the model yes um, so which fine tuning does uh, it serve? no so i i talked about you can fine tune your model somewhere else and import it okay but at this point you cannot fine tune it using this the podman desktop itself so all we can do is is the model serving part yes in the podman we, yes we cannot train it we cannot fine tune it no nothing at this it. point but that's in the roadmap all that's in the that's in the podman desktop roadmap yes okay yep what is the hardware requirement for this can I run it on my personal laptop without any graphical cards? Yes. From what I understand, you should be able to uh, work with it with a... Uh, I... So practically, I did this using a VM and I am sure VM doesn't have a graphics card, so it worked fine. Okay, and uh, one more question. When in the roadmap there is... Uh the let's say the option to train or uh, fine tune a model i would have to need a graphical card for that right that so if i don't have it i then can't it do doesn't it. work the, so, only this part it will be able to other than that no so what is the exact use case of, so what is the exact Case of, yeah. Uh, so recipe. if you look at recipes right now, like I said, these are only four to five use cases right now. So for example, I can actually go to, let's say, uh, chatbot. I can change the model, which is going to be a list. So, so we can safely say that, no, I'm uh, talking about the real life uh, yep. use case. If I would, so, so it's safe to say that currently it is... Um, it is serving the purpose for by personal uh, yes running your... llms like llm backed these five applications or either a playground with your own context in it and it locally can, i can run it locally so it will be very secure and just yes yes available that's the that's the part it is serving Any more questions? All right, guys. Thanks for being here. Uh, one more question. Sure. <laughs> I don't need the microphone. Uh, you do, so that because you that's recording. OK. Uh, good. Uh, now I know there is an option. But what I really want to try it, is there a place to go with a documentation I could read and have it set up on my laptop? Yes. Um, so the setup is this. I mean, I can point you to the document, but the setup is usually this. You go here, um, you go to extensions. Okay, extensions. Dead. Very nice. That's what I love. So I have bootable containers and yep. So you install this extension and then you get something like this. And then the workflow continues. It is basically just an extension right now. It is not anything um, groundbreaking that you have to install and solve dependencies for. You just have to install Podman desktop and install the extension. Yep. Are the prompts you used available anywhere public or are you planning to publish those anywhere? I can. It's a YouTube video. It's under Creative Commons right now. You can see the whole prompt in the window from the YouTube video? Yep. Okay. I wasn't sure. Yep. Yes, but locally. 
the prompt in, so basically it is the prompt engine ring the max we can use. yes for, so i am using the prompt engine playground you can use a summarizer or object detector any of the ai recipes so you have so there are like recipe catalogs these are the recipes if you want you can use all of them like each one of them would have its own in like ways to set up like if i open object detection it would give you how to set it up in one go right um, and then you can set this entire thing up and you can get yourself a object detection with the same llm okay and is is there a way to build the skill or no no, no. way to feed the data I was just thinking to Matthew's question, if that's a possibility, maybe we can feed the week. week. So every answer that you get, you typically get a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Uh, based on the thumbs up, you know, it learns saying that this is a more appropriate answer. And next time you get a better one. Um, so that's all. So Sumantra, have you tried, um, you generated the test case. Have you tried generating the automation code to also along with it? No. Hey, so, it, so here's the thing. Uh, can you repeat the question once more, the mic? Uh, so I, uh, so you, you have tried generating the test yeah. case, which is more Adam-like test case. Yep. Uh, have you tried generating the automation code? Also, are you no, so there's a code generator recipe which you can use. It's the same thing. You've got to set it up and then you can use the code generation. But I have not used it personally for on the playground end of things, no. Okay, so I was wondering if uh, you copy the test case and then see if it can generate yes. the code yes. for that. Yes, that would be a nice use case to try out, okay. yes. And then Sudhir can fire us all. <laughs> I was joking. All right, out of time. Thanks. All right, thank you guys. See you. Bye bye.